Again, my name is Gwen, and I will be your host today. We're going to be discussing assessing executive function and, attest- and attention. Assessments are tools that provide insight and direction. Now, many of you are probably here today and you're thinking, but I already know where my areas of concerns are, right? I already know my strengths and my weaknesses. Perhaps you're here because you, as an adult, you are struggling with memory, or maybe you're watching your child at school and he's having a really hard time following through with instructions or completing assignments, although he's very bright. Or maybe you're a professional here and you have a lot of different clients who are struggling with executive function. You can go ahead and type in some of the areas of concern you have right now, and you can type those in the chat box. So we get a good understanding of who's here today and some of the areas you're concerned about. So since you do already have some areas of concerns, you may be wondering, do I really need a test to confirm those concerns, right? Uh, You may be thinking that, you know, I already know that my child has a hard time with emotion regulation. Do I actually need a test to confirm that? Well, there are a lot of benefits because when you do an assessment, it will give you a clear path, right? Now I have a SIBO And he is interested in looking at procrastination because procrastination is an area of difficulty. So you can look at those areas of difficulty and know what you struggle with, but how do you know which path to take? Do you stay the course? Do you just keep doing what you're currently doing and hope for the best? Do you take the path to the left? that has some accommodations for you? Do you take the path to the right that perhaps has some accommodations and some skill building? How do you know which path to take? That's where assessments really come in because assessments are tools that can help us determine the correct path. Assessments define the problem areas. So Elizabeth says she needs help with controlling emotional responses. So when we go through some of our assessments, that can be confirmed for us and allow us to make that path for her. So it defines the problem areas, determines your strengths and your weaknesses, because it's important to know both indicates the severity of those weaknesses. You know, I talk to a lot of parents who will say, well, I know my child is struggling and he has a really hard time controlling his impulsivity or completing assignments, but I don't know if that's really ADHD or weak executive function, or is it just being seven, right? So how do you know if it's severe, right? How do you know if there is a problem there that needs to be addressed with a plan? assessments will give us a good answer to that. It allows us to then look at those strengths and weaknesses in order to customize a plan based on your individual needs, not anyone else's needs, a customized plan that will help you reach your final destination. And it also provides a baseline to document progress. If we have that starting point and we have a plan in place, then it's important that we monitor that plan and our progress along that path as we go. So if we make a plan, typically we will put our goals in that plan, how we're going to reach those goals and a timeline. So let's say our timeline is 40 hours of training. 40 hours, we expect to have this done. Or let's say it's a 10-month plan. If you have an IEP for your child, it's that one school year, right? And mid-year or middle of that plan, we should do another assessment to see how we're progressing. When we have that baseline, it allows us to do a mid-assessment so we can see how we've progressed. 
And we can determine, do we need to customize this plan further? Have we reached some of our goals? Can we let some things go? Do we need to incorporate some new strategies? So it's great to have that baseline. Then when we're ready to graduate this path, right? When we think we've reached our final destination, we can take that assessment again to make certain that we are there, that we have reached all of our goals. So there are a lot of benefits to doing an assessment, not just knowing that you have these areas of difficulties or some areas of concern, but what can we do about it? Uh, I have Emma here and she says she has a six-year-old son, first grader, struggles with listening to the teacher, following directions, sitting still, but is still incredibly bright and would rather rush through homework tests to complete it, though he would make 100% if he slowed down and took his time. And you know, uh, Emma, we have an assessment called FOCUS, and we're going to get into that, where we look at impulse control. And that's really very typical, where if they're very impulsive, that in the classroom looks like rushing through their work just to get it done. And that's where those careless errors may come into place. So based on that severity, we can then determine a plan to help them learn how to control those impulsive responses. When we look at ADHD or executive function, we know that attention is just one piece of the puzzle, right? There are many other areas, many other pieces of the puzzle we have to look at, like, as Emma says, impulsivity, or as our uh, Elizabeth said, emotional control, or Eusebio is looking at procrastination. So we have two different assessments available. One is called the focus assessment, and the other is the brief assessment. And these two assessments allow us to look at the other pieces of the puzzle. So we can look at processing speed. We can look at attention, impulse control, emotion regulation. We look at all of the different pieces in order to get a clear, direct path a plan to help you reach your final destination. So let's look at the two different assessments that we have available for you to consider. The brief assessment, the brief, brief is an acronym for behavior rating inventory of executive function. The brief assessment is uh, about 20 minutes in length. You can do the brief assessment if you're five years old all the way up through adulthood. It's an online questionnaire that can be done from your home or your office. It's designed to evaluate executive function from multiple perspectives. So let's say that you have a child um, that is in school. You can fill out the brief for your child, and then you can also have the teacher fill out the brief for your child. And that is really a good opportunity to allow us to get an overview, multiple perspectives of how your child is performing in the area of executive function, all of those processes in the classroom and at home. Are they very similar or are we seeing differences between the two? Also, if your child is 13 or older, or if you are an adult, you can do a self-assessment. And I find the self-assessments really valuable. Uh, of course, if you're an adult, they're valuable because it gives you time, you know, a 20 minute block of time where you actually have the opportunity to reflect on these other, these different processes and how they're affecting you either positively or negatively. And then also for your child, if you have a teenager, it's really interesting to see their perspective. How are they performing? And uh, I was working with a parent the other day and we were reviewing the brief assessment and she had filled out the brief assessment for her 15-year-old son. And then her 15-year-old son actually uh, filled out the assessment. And when we looked at the results, we were really surprised to see that her responses and his responses were almost identical. 
So that was really interesting to her because she never realized that he was even concerned about these different areas, that he was even aware that he was struggling in these different areas. Because, you know, if you have a teenager, it's often hard for them to express their feelings or express or talk about what they're struggling with. But when he had that opportunity to complete the questionnaire, then that opened a door to communication where they can actually talk about the different areas of his concern and make a plan of action. It The brief pinpoints where and why you struggle. So let's look at the different areas that the brief assesses. Of course, we're looking at all of the different areas of executive function. These are all of the different processes. So we look at inhibit. So this is what uh, Emma brought up earlier, that inhibitory control where her son is just rushing through the work just to get it done. Um, but because of that, he makes careless errors. It could also be if you're an adult, you may notice that you often interrupt people when they're talking. You don't mean to, but you find yourself constantly interrupting people. Or perhaps you're just not thinking about consequences before acting. That's inhibitory control. We also look at self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is part of executive function that allows you to truly understand how your behaviors, how your actions affect others. Shift, that's mental flexibility. That's your ability to transition from one situation to another situation freely. So if you have difficulty with shift, that typically means, uh, let's say your child is involved in an activity and it's time to transition to dinner and he has an absolute meltdown because he has that difficulty shifting from one situation to another. Emotion control. And this is uh, what one of our attendees here, Elizabeth, uh, mentioned that emotion regulation is difficult for her. So we're going to look at the process of emotion regulation. If you or your child is having a hard time or your client with emotion regulation, that often looks like some situation has occurred. And it was a small situation, what appeared to be a small situation, and yet your child had an absolute meltdown over it. And you think, why are you having such a huge response to something so simple? That's that emotion regulation. Initiate and task completion. Those go hand in hand, don't they? That ability to start an assignment right away, keep your attention just on that one assignment until completion. Working memory. This is a big area of concern for many of us. That's the ability to take in information, manipulate that information in some way, and give a response, much like a mathematical word problem, or it also involves reading comprehension. So it helps with comprehension, evaluation, problem solving, planning and organizing. Task monitoring, if you are able to task monitor, that means that you're checking your work along the way, that you understand when you have made mistakes and you can go back and correct yourself and organization of materials. So these are all of the different processes we look at when we do the brief assessment. So you're going to go through a series of questions and you're going to respond accordingly, often, sometimes, never, always, and those are rated. So there are a series of questions in all of those processes that pertain to all of those different processes. So these are a couple of questions that pertain to working memory. And at the end of the assessment, then we get a full report that breaks down the areas of concern and the areas of strengths. This is an example. And of course, the results are uh, a lot longer than this. I've just kind of condensed the results here um, for our uh, webinar so that you could see what we can look at. And so you see that our student A, as a result of the brief, there are concerns noted on the following scales, inhibit, shift, 
emotional control, working memory, planning, and organizing. However, there were some strengths as well. There were strengths in the area of self-monitoring, initiation, task monitoring, and organization of materials. So now we are able to evaluate the strengths and the weaknesses, right? And we're able to see within that assessment, the severity of those areas. Now it's time to make a plan because it's not enough to just know the areas of strengths and weaknesses. You know, I've talked to many of you who have said, well, we went and had a neuropsych evaluation and now I have a 24 report that tells us all of the areas of concern. So what do I do, right? So that's the next step. That's what we have to do next in order to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and find that path towards success. So we're going to take this information and we're going to start making a customized plan. Now your plan may include accommodations, but it also needs to include skill building because many of you probably have received accommodations, perhaps for yourself, or you've made accommodations for yourself, or perhaps your child has a 504 in school. So there are specific accommodations that have been made. So I can teach you how to use a checklist, how to make your checklist and how to check it off. I can show you how to do a calendar and you can spend two hours creating a beautifully organized calendar. But if we don't address the root cause of your difficulties. If we don't look at your ability to remember that you have a calendar or to be able to remember to look at your calendar before you leave the house, if we don't look at improving your focus and your memory, then it's really difficult for you to get maximum benefit from those accommodations that we've put into place, right? So Accommodations are great, and we want you to have those tools in your tool in your toolbox, right? Because we want you to be able to use them. But we have to look at the root cause, and we have to address and develop those specific skills that you need in order to use those tools successfully. So our plan really should combine both accommodations and skill building. So let's look at this just in the area of working memory. And uh, we know that our, our student, student A, had difficulty with working memory. So one of the accommodations could be when the presentation of new materials, we might need to alter that, right? Because he is struggling in the area of working memory. So we may need to give student A additional processing time, or at least some additional time to rehearse new information, because we know that working memory is difficult. So that's the accommodation we'll put into place. But then we have to look at the root cause. He is struggling with working memory. So in his play attention plan, we are actually going to include the module working memory so we can directly teach and develop that skill of working memory. And remember, when we're doing play attention, we are developing all of those foundational skills that are necessary for strong executive function. So now we have a plan. This isn't, of course, a complete plan for working memory, but we have a combined approach where we're putting accommodations in place and we're incorporating specific skill building into his plan of action. So that is the brief. The brief again is a behavior rating inventory of executive function. And we're going to be able to look at all of the processes of executive function. That is a subjective assessment, right? It is based on your experience, your opinions. The focus assessment is objective. It's not influenced by uh, your opinion. Focus is a norm reference test of attentional control. It can be taken again, five years old, all the way up through adulthood. It takes 20 minutes 
and it is computer based. Now, I should mention here because I get this question a lot. Uh, there is no reading involved. So if you have a younger child who's maybe five years old and you're concerned that he or she is not going to be able to read instructions, that's okay. The focus assessment does not include any reading. So there are certain types of stimuli. It is a 20 minute assessment, but it is designed to be very low stimuli, very mundane, because we know that if we give you an assessment that is very high stimuli, that is very entertaining or of high interest, you can probably hyper-focus or your child or your clients can hyper-focus in that situation. We want to see how you perform when you're given a low stimuli, mundane activity, much like homework or office work where you have to direct and sustain your attention for longer periods of time to low stimuli. So there's a couple of different types of stimuli, a solid star or a star outline, and you have to respond accordingly. And then there are uh, distractors that appear, both visual and auditory. So it's measuring an individual's capacity to choose what to pay attention to and what to ignore. It's looking at attentional control. And attentional control is the ability to remain focused on goal-relevant stimuli and information in the presence of interfering distractors. And like I said earlier, it will give you distractors both visual and auditory. So we look at four different constructs of attention. We look at consistency. Now, consistency is the quality of your responses. And if you have very inconsistent responses throughout that 20 minute block of time, that will show that you're probably on the lower end of the scale of consistency. And if you're lower than the norm in the area of consistency, in the day to day, that usually looks like someone who has a hard time starting and completing assignments in a timely manner. So 15 minutes of homework is taking two or three hours, or it may be that your child knows his addition facts today and tomorrow it will look like he's never seen them before. So there's that inconsistency from the day to day. We also look at performance and performance is the accuracy and the speed of your responses. So if you are lower than the norm in the area of performance, that probably means that you're a slow processor, that you have a hard time following through with multiple step instructions. If you're a slow processor, you may notice that you understand the material, but it just gives you, it takes you a little bit longer to give a response. Some of you may have experienced that where you absolutely understand what that person is saying, but you need a moment to process the information and then give a response. Or for your child, if your child is a slow processor, you can say, go to your room, put away your sneakers, bring down your jacket. And he does the first thing or the last thing, but then forgets the rest. And sometimes if we don't understand that this is caused by slow processing, it may appear that your child is just defiant, right? And if you think, if your perception is that your child is just being defiant, or this can even happen in the classroom oftentimes where the teacher will say, he, I give instructions and he just doesn't listen. He just doesn't do anything I ask. Well, is it really defiance? Or if we look at the focus assessment, is this skill, is this cognitive area actually weak for him? You know, if you had a child who had a learning disability in reading and they did the assessment, they found there was a learning disability in reading, you wouldn't then give your child a novel to read and say, just read that right? You would make accommodations. You would have a plan for skill building to teach the different skills associated with the reading process. And that's what we need to do here. If we have a clear view that your child is a slow processor, then you can't expect him to be able to 
go to your room, put away your sneakers and bring down your jacket, right? And when you can understand that we just need to work on that processing speed, right? We need to make accommodations and work on that skill in order for him to do that. So then that can bring down your anxiety level, right? Because it can be very stressful if you think your child just isn't listening to you or being defiant. But if you have an understanding that there is a root cause that we can address, then that stress and anxiety will come down for not only you, but your child. And you can have that discussion with the teachers as well. Impulse control. Impulse control, we talked about this with the brief assessment, that ability to stop, think, and then act. And then we're going to look at distractions, how you deal with distractors, both auditory and visual. So again, we get a clear view so that we can see the different strengths and weaknesses. We can see the severity. We now, as we talked about with performance, we develop an understanding of where these difficulties lie, and then we can make a path towards success. So I wanted to share um, the results for one of our students. This is Kara. And when she took the original uh, assessment, the focus assessment, she was six years old. And she took the assessment in January, 2016. So we looked at the results of just the area of consistency here. That's what we're looking at here. And remember, consistency is the accuracy of her responses. And um, so if she's having a hard time here, that would make it very difficult for her to start and complete any tasks. Or, you know, as she's learning those addition uh, computations or those math facts, it makes it very difficult for her to remember those math facts from day to day. She's very inconsistent in what she knows. So we look at the area of consistency. The blue line is her individual report. Okay. And this is what you'll see if you do a focus, whether you're a child or an adult, and it is norm reference. So we're looking at six-year-old females across the board here. So the blue line is her individual report. The light purple means she fell below the average, okay? So she's below the average in the area of consistency. So she was right at 24% on consistency. So out of that 20 minute block of time, she was accurate, her quality was there. She was able to maintain that focus for about 24% of the time. In our plan, this is where we talk about getting to that final destination. In our plan with her, we want to eventually get her up towards this 51% or higher, okay? The reason we want to move her towards the right and maybe even a little bit higher is because as she ages, that line's going to shift a little bit to the right. So our plan should, should address accommodations, and skill development that will help her go from being able to sustain her attention for 24% of the time to moving her above that 51% or higher, okay? So our plan with her specifically included accommodations and also specific cognitive skills within her play attention plan. So in play attention, um, we have some activities, but for her accommodations, one accommodation was providing her with short breaks when she has to do a task, because it's very difficult for her to sustain her attention to one task. So we might break that task up and give her maybe one or two minute little mini breaks in between. Okay. So that's an accommodation, but remember what we talked about earlier in order to make those tools, make those accommodations effective, we have to, in the meantime, be developing skills, get at the root cause. So in her play attention plan, we're going to teach her attention stamina. That is her ability to direct and sustain her attention at will. We're going to incorporate time on task. Time on task is going to teach her how to start an assignment right away keep her attention just on that assignment until completion, that closed end tasking. And that goes back to our um, attendee earlier who talked about her son 
And um, Emma's six-year-old son, like she said, he's very bright. So if he would just start and control his impulsivity and stay on task until completion, he could get 100%, right? So it's usually not that they don't know how to do the activity. It's the process that's difficult. So within Kara's plan of action, we're going to teach her how to start, stay on task until completion. And then we're also going to incorporate the academic bridge. And what academic bridge is going to do is it's going to allow us to monitor her attention while she's doing her reading, her spelling, her math. We're going to get that real-time feedback. And more importantly, she's going to get that real-time feedback regarding her attention during Academic Bridge. And if you haven't seen Academic Bridge or you haven't chatted about play attention with us um, and how the skill building is done, we would be happy to do a one-on-one -on -one consult with you, or you can come to one of our upcoming webinars and we'll go into that much more in depth. But those are the specific cognitive skills that we'll put into her plan in order to teach her how to start and complete, how to move that blue line up above 51%. So we put her plan of action into place. And this is just so far, of course, we're going to do attention, stamina, time on task, academic bridge, and remember working memory. We're going to address that as well. Now, as we go through the other areas of the assessment, We'll probably be adding more accommodations and more skills within play attention. And then we need to know, have we reached our final destination? So we have the plan, which is a, com a combination of those accommodations and skill building, getting to the root. But now we need to know, did we reach the final destination, right? We had specific goals in mind for CARA. And that's where the assessments really help you determine, have we been successful? Did the plan work? Do we need more accommodations or have we reached our goal? So you can see here when we did the post-evaluation, so the pre-evaluation with Cara was done in January, 2016. And she was again at that 24%, 24% of the time she was able to sustain her attention. By the end of our journey, when she went through that path, that path to the right that had the accommodations and skill building, she was at 88%, well above that dark purple line, which was our goal, right? We wanted to move her above that 51%. And when we got to the end of her um, program, she was at 88% of the time. So 88% of that 20 minute block of time, she was able to direct and sustain her attention and give accurate responses. I also wanted to show you impulsivity because this was really interesting. When we looked at her impulsivity, now the this previous one, the consistency is considered to be a positive construct. So the higher the number, the better, right? So we want to push her to the right because if you're consistent, then that helps your attention, that helps your executive function. With impulsivity, the higher the number, that is not where we want to be. We want low, the lower the number, the better, because impulsivity is a negative construct. Impulsive responses negatively affect your attention. So you can see she was at 88%, very impulsive. That means Within that 20 minute block of time, 88% of the time she was impulsive. So our plan with her when we were developing her customized program was to move her down to 14% or lower. And you can see June, 2017, when she was seven years old, she was down to 1%. 1% of the time in that 20 minute block of time, she was impulsive. And that is, exactly where we want to be, where she is now able to direct and sustain her attention. She's able to control her impulsivity. So of course, our plan with her was much more comprehensive than what I've shown you. But I wanted to give you that overview of how we can take assessments, how we can pinpoint the different areas 
of strengths and weaknesses in order to develop a clear path to success. So assessments are really important for a variety of reasons. Remember, they describe the problem areas. They show us your strengths and weaknesses, indicate the severity of those weaknesses, and allows us to develop a very specific plan of action based on your individual needs. And then, as I just showed you, being able to look at that baseline where we started and where we ended is so important because we could see with Cara, we definitely reached our goal with that plan. And remember though, we also did a mid evaluation, a mid uh, assessment, so that if there were any areas we needed to customize further, we did so at that time in order to help us reach our end goal. So assessments can be very valuable to you. And we have those two assessments available to you, which are very easy to do. Each of them takes, as I mentioned, about 20 minutes, and you can do them in the comfort of your own home, uh, or you can uh, do them at your office, whatever's most convenient for you. So I do want to invite you, if you are interested in receiving an assessment and allowing us to develop a plan of action and talk to you about your individual strengths and weaknesses, that's what we really specialize in. So if you're interested in a focus or a brief assessment or both, um, then you can simply type assessment in the chat box. And when you type assessment in the chat box, we will reach out to you, answer any additional questions that you may have, although you can just type in questions if you have them right now. The assessments, uh, each assessment is $50, uh, but with your webinar special as a way of saying thank you, you're going to get half price off of all of your assessments. Now, remember, it's not just enough to do the assessment. We also do the follow-up. So, if, whether you do the brief or the focus, or if you do them both, it's nice to do both of them simply because it gives us an overview of executive function in the day-to-day. -day, and then it also gives us that objective att test of attentional control. So whether you do one or both of them, we are going to set aside at about 30 to 40 minute block of time to then follow up with you uh, we will review the assessments with you, talk about the different areas, and help you make a plan of action, okay? And those plans of action may be simply talking about accommodations, or if you're interested in developing a play attention plan where we're pinpointing different cognitive skill areas, then we can talk about the different cognitive skills that we would put into your play attention course. Um, Ari, that's a good question. Which of the two would you recommend we do uh, if we just started with one? I guess my question to you would be uh, the age of the individual and also are you interested in the, uh, uh, the opinion and getting an overview of the day-to-day -day in executive function or are you more interested in specifically seeing those areas of consistency and accuracy and impulse control? Oh, I, you know, I, I probably would go with the um, brief assessment with a 15 year old then. Um, and it might be interesting for you, like I mentioned earlier, to do the assessment uh, yourself, do the evaluation for your 15 year old, but also have your 15 year old do the self assessment. Because when I talked about that parent earlier who had a 15 year old and their results were so similar, that just opened the door to a bigger conversation um, where we could really help with um, a plan of action. Elizabeth, I'm signed up for Play Attention Program. Uh, they are additional. Those are the assessments are options for you, and they are additional if you would like to include those. Okay. Well, Emily, that's a good question. 
we we cannot let me be very clear with focus assessment it is not a diagnostic tool right so the focus assessment cannot diagnose adhd if you want a diagnosis of adhd then you would have to go to a medical professional because that's con- considered to be a medical um label. So if you want a diagnosis of ADHD, then it would be more appropriate to go to a medical professional. What the focus assessment will allow us to do is actually pinpoint the different areas of concern. So we know which areas we can address in a customized plan. I hope that answers your questions. Okay. Uh, Many of you have typed down assessments, so just know that we are going to get back to you as soon as possible to help you with that. And again, we can answer your questions. Yes, they are. You will receive them all at half price. So it's just half price and you get the assessment instructions as well as a 30 to 40 minute follow up call with us where we'll review the uh, results with you. No, Elaine, that's, it's not necessary. Um, You know, if you already, you know, getting a medical evaluation is such a personal decision. Um, So if you feel like you need a medical evaluation, that's completely up to you. Some people want that medical evaluation. Some do not. Some just know that they have these areas of concern and they want a plan to address those cognitive skill areas that they need to improve. So that is completely up to you. And what, what you really need to think about is, you know, what is your plan? What, what do you want out of either a diagnosis or an assessment? Okay. And if you want to talk about that um, a little bit further, just type in assessment and we'll talk about that further. Okay. All right. Let me make sure I have everyone's questions. A couple of you have asked about what areas we can address within play attention. So let me just show you that. Of course, when you're starting your play attention program, you're going to have your body wave technology. And remember that body wave technology monitors your brain activity that tells us how attentive you are. So that monitor sits on your arm and it monitors brain activity indicative of attention and cognitive processing. So that's what allows you to then control all of the cognitive exercises just with your mind or more specifically your attention alone. So when we're looking at the different cognitive skills and what we can address, your customized course will of course begin with the foundations of executive function, which include attention stamina, visual tracking, task completion, short-term memory, filtering distractions, and transfer and generalization. Those are the foundational skills that come standard with play attention. When you move to the intermediate and advanced skill options, we tie in processing speed, we tie in task switching, impulse control, and distractors. So we have those core cognitive skills, Each of the cognitive skill areas also, in addition to addressing the skill area, address processing speed, task switching, impulse control, and distractors. And then we have a variety of course modules if you would like to bring your program up to the master class. And those include working memory, auditory processing, hand-eye coordination, social skills, motor skills, spatial memory, and mindfulness. So you can see we have a variety of activities. So not only will we discuss different accommodations that should be in your toolbox, but we're going to get to the root cause and we're going to develop certain cognitive skill areas that the assessments show us are weak for you, but we're going to address those skill areas strengthen those skill areas so that you can use all of those tools, all of those accommodations that you have in your toolbox. And if you do have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us at our 800 number or contact us through our website. 
We look forward to working with you very soon. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your time and attention. Take care, everyone.